Good evening. The British are by some distance the most generous major nation on earth to foreigners, or at least our government is on our behalf. Our overseas aid budget has been set by law at 0.7% of national income. We spend more on it than on long-term social care at home. Now, though, it's being cut. With national debt skyrocketing because of the pandemic, we can't afford it, it seems. Some think the cut will prove permanent. We can afford a major increase in defence spending, though, to counter new threats, cyber warfare, drones, that kind of thing. Here are two competing moral visions of Britain's place in the world. To some, the contrast is between belligerence and benevolence. To others, the first duty of any government is to protect its citizens, and charity should begin, and maybe even end, at home. Both plead pragmatic justification, increasing Britain's influence as well as an ethical imperative. Both have been accused of waste and ineffectiveness. Both claim to live by moral codes that have not always been maintained. Is spending taxpayers' money on defence morally better or worse than spending it on foreign aid? That's our moral maze tonight. The panel, Melanie Phillips, social commentator at The Times, Anne McElvoy, senior editor at The Economist, Ash Sarkar, another senior editor, in her case at the left-wing Navara Media Group, and the chief executive of the RSA, Matthew Taylor. Uh, uh, Melanie, these, these are, I think, two sides of the same coin, aren't they, morally as well as politically? I don't think so. Uh, I think that the first duty of a nation is to its people and to defend its people. Overseas aid, which is fine in theory and some of it in practice, but much of it fails to achieve its objectives. And so it's largely, in my view, hypocritical chest beating for Western virtue. Matthew Taylor. The intuitive sense that giving aid is morally benign while defence spending is morally ambiguous may need to be qualified, does need to be qualified by the reality of the world and policy implementation. But still, I think it contains a truth about how we understand our national interest and national responsibilities. And McElvoy. Two sides of the same coin, but one is not inherently morally superior to the other. In both cases, it depends what you do with it. It's a case of practical morality and the proof of our ethics being in the pudding and how it's consumed around the world. So no, I don't think that defence and security is, if you like, on the moral pranger on this one. I think both sides of this need to defend their moral rectitude and their usefulness. Ash Sarkar. I think that the aid versus defence debate shows that we still can't think of Britain's position in the world beyond bombing other countries' corrupt elites or paying to prop them up. And I also think that there is a certain irony in that some of the most ardent voices arguing that we shouldn't increase our foreign aid spending, we should in fact reduce it because charity begins at home, often have that very belief desert them when it comes to supporting increased welfare spending. Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Professor Michael Clark, who's former Director General of the Royal United Services Institute and an advisor on national security strategy. Uh, Professor Clark, why, in your view, is an increase in defence spending a moral imperative at this time? Uh, because the world out there is getting a lot more antithetical to our interests, it's getting downright dangerous in some respects to us. And also that um, the Prime Minister wanted to try to make it clear that this is the first most imaginative step in the so-called global Britain vision of the 2020s. I mean, as we get through Brexit, we need to prove to the world and to ourselves that rightly or wrongly, Brexit is not going to break us. So that was the that was the purpose of the announcement that he made. Ash Sarkar. So even John Major, who's not exactly a lefty, admits that we're a second rate power and that Britain's status on the world stage has diminished. Our moral authority, others would argue, irreparably damaged by adventurous warfare in the Middle East. So I'm asking you, are these promises to bolster defence spending just a very expensive fig leaf trying to cover up the shame of post-imperial decline? No, uh, they're all part of a, a big suite of, of things that we do in terms of external policy. So defence, diplomacy, foreign aid, our intelligence services, our research and development, all of those are the things that we project to the outside world. And they're all part of a spectrum. And in theory, you've got to do all of them as well as you can in order to try to shape the world in ways that are favourable to your nation. In our case, it's a question of being favourable to a, a capitalist liberal democracy. And after all, liberal democracy is very much on the retreat at the moment. There's an awful lot of, of autocracy out there and downright tyranny.
I've seen you argue elsewhere that there's a moral case for defence spending because the first duty of government is to protect its citizens. But in my lifetime, with the notable exception of Kosovo, the wars that we fought have destabilised countries abroad and made terrorist attacks more likely over here. So isn't there a problem perhaps with too closely associating safety with militarisation and not, for instance, redressing global inequalities in wealth and in power? Well, there are good and bad cases. I mean, you rightly say, I mean, the, the military can be misused, can be used for purposes which, which are strategically um, incorrect or strategically foolish. And that has been the case in the past. But in, in 1982, the military was used to reverse a naked aggression. In 1991, in the Middle East, the, the military was used to reverse a naked aggression when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. I mean, complete uh, aggression. The military was used again to prevent a war getting worse in the Balkans in 1995, quite muscular military action. It was a bit ambiguous, but it did the job. It was used very successfully in Sierra Leone in the year 2000 to prevent a a bunch of of cutthroat gangs getting control of the government. So the military can be used either well or badly. And if you look at British military operations since the end of the Cold War, there have been about 12 of them. They've all been tactically successful in military terms, but some of them, the two biggest, of course, Iraq in 2003 and Afghanistan after 2006, have gone wrong strategically because you could argue they were used in the wrong sort of way. But that's not the military's fault as such. It's the it's the relationship between military and politics that is the fault there. Well, maybe to probe this question of the relationship between the military and politics a little bit further, we've seen how in Yemen, water scarcity and grain prices exacerbated the country's destabilisation. And yet the response of the UK government was to provide bombs and planes and maintenance support to the Saudi forces, which are now partially responsible for the world's worst humanitarian crisis. So if the biggest threat to global stability is climate change rather than Russia or China or Iran, if the government took that kind of security seriously, shouldn't it be ploughing all that money that's earmarked for defence into meeting net zero emissions within the next decade? I mean, climate change is going to require a lot more cash than defence takes up. I mean, defence takes up uh, less than 5% of what the government spends overall. We're going to have to spend a great deal more than that to address climate change. But you're right on the, the Yemen case. I mean, British Um, activities with Saudi Arabia are at the very edge of what is legal and acceptable in terms of what is happening in Yemen. And I think that our relationship with Saudi Arabia in defence terms has been for years very questionable. But that doesn't negate the principle that defence is an important expenditure for government. It's an important thing that government should do. And it can be either used well or badly. And that rather depends on the government at the time. Matthew Turner. As your last answer kind of illustrates... You know, whatever the reality, aid is ultimately driven by a pretty clear moral imperative. But isn't the case for defence inherently morally ambiguous? Uh, Not to me, because A, countries do need to be defended, which is to say that our interests need to be defended and the interests of our friends and allies. I mean, we all argue, I think, that partnerships in the world are very important. So some of our partners, say in Japan or South Korea or in the Gulf, indeed, Um, are under tremendous pressure and could do with our help. But there's also a a, a moral point that ought to be made that quite a lot of what defence forces do, you would define as soft power. I mean, British forces are are employed in around 30 or 35 countries around the world at any given time. And they're doing things which foreign aid would recognise. They're helping train uh, other forces. They're actually working on uh, civilian projects. They're doing disaster relief. Quite a lot of what the military does day to day ends up on the softer end of the spectrum but of course they're there they're trained they are trained to kill people and break things that's the point that's the ultimate purpose for which they uh, exist and i understand that and and when boris johnson announced uh, the extra money for defense he said this was to protect the public and extend british influence and i thought generally the way to protect yourself is to keep your head down not to be making a big noise so isn't that a an interesting example of how the the case for defense is it it moves around depending on which group of people you're trying to seduce with it yes he he talked about uh, that that we would again be able to tip the scales of history which was a typical boris johnson sort of a flight of fancy i think i don't think he meant he really could do that but we know what he meant The, the fact is britain does make a choice to be out and about in the world. We, we, we've always pretended 
that this somehow was, was an imperative of our position as a trading nation. We have to be out and about. We have to we have to go to the crisis before the crisis comes to us. I've long argued that that's not an imperative. It's, it's choice we choose to make. We, we could keep our heads down. We could. But we'd be a different sort of country if we did. And it seems that we like to be the sort of country that is a global power that plays a significantly useful, I wouldn't say tipping the scales of history, but we play a significantly useful role around the globe. Ultimately, though, Professor Clark, behind all the bluster, isn't defence justified fundamentally by national self-interest, whilst aid is justified by some notion of global solidarity? For sure. At, at root, it is. Defence is about what is good for your country, and if you argue that, well, helping to build international stability through all measures, military, foreign aid and so on, that that's good for your country, it does come down to a sort of a national interest uh, justification. And the first duty of government is to protect its citizens. And then we can argue about you know, what is the best way to protect your citizens. In some cases, you want to have a, a military defense. In other cases, you want to shape the international environment in a way that indirectly helps to protect your citizens. Professor Clark, thanks very much indeed. Our next witness is Dr Sam Perlow Freeman from the Campaign Against Arms Trade, uh, who is opposed to an increase in defence spending. Um, How so? Do we not need to be able to defend ourselves in the 21st century? Well, the problem is that, as as Matthew was just saying, a lot of what's called defence spending is not actually about defending the country from attack. It's about projecting military might around the world in this very unproven, dubious notion that this is going to make us and the world more secure. And it's about preparing for the sort of massive military interventions that have generally been so disastrous about the past 20 years. The threats we really need to defend against are pandemics. Our response to COVID-19 has been hideously ill-prepared and above all the climate crisis. OK, Anne McElvoy? It would be possible, wouldn't it, to separate out some of your earlier list and say that you should be rightly stringent about the arms trade and keep a very careful eye on it or constrict a lot of it. But at the same time, you cannot credibly call yourself well defended unless you are able to fight an enemy. I mean, that's the essence of it. What's wrong with that? The government itself has listed a conventional military attack from a hostile state as an extremely low level of threat of possibility. And as I say, you know, if defence spending, if military spending were just about that, it would be a different matter. And I have to say, not all of the money uh, Johnson's announced I I disagree with. I think beefing up our cyber defences is a a very good idea, though that's not exactly linked to what Michael Clark calls, you know, breaking things and killing people. It's a different sort of defence again. But doesn't the moral Um, conundrum for you, sorry to interrupt you, but just do do you hmm. not, the moral conundrum calls at the point when cyber defences and other forms, if you like, of virtual warfare are no longer working, what then? I think that's a, a bit of a dubious proposition. I think a lot of what we spend most money on, things like nuclear weapons, things like aircraft carriers, they have very little use even in any likely military scenario that we might be talking about. Compared to the things that we actually need to uh, defend against, which, as I say, are mostly non-military in any case, they are a gigantic waste of money, as well as being part of an escalating global arms race, which Britain certainly isn't the only one participating in. But I think the world would be a far better place if all countries that are involved in this were going in the other direction. Well, I I do agree with you. We'd all like the world to be a far better place. But you're asking us to accept a particular hierarchy in which you tell us that things like COVID and climate change, which are major threats, are more important. And therefore, it's a sum zero game. The other stuff doesn't matter. But as we've seen in the COVID crisis, it is precisely the unexpected but high impact event that causes us most suffering around the world. The same case can be made about an armed intervention you weren't expecting from a hostile power. I am not arguing here for reducing UK military spending to zero. Uh, I'm arguing about what we're planning for and therefore what we're spending money on. And as I say, uh, our strategy is based on the idea that we're going to send up to 50,000 troops abroad to intervene in some major crisis. 
this has repeatedly proved to be disastrous over the past 20 years. And we are spending far too much on this idea of being a great power rather than on anything that actually gives us tangible security, whether military or any other sort. Melanie Phillips? You, as I understand it, disapprove of the kind of military adventurism that actually kills people. I wonder, therefore, why you approve of aid programmes which, uh, to a large extent, prop up the kind of dictators and tyrants that kill, torture or oppress their own people. I am completely opposed to military aid or security aid, and Kat has actively campaigned against this to repressive governments. We just yesterday put out a release against uh, military training of Nigerian armed forces. But that's not what the great majority of UK aid does. And in fact, DFID that the government's abolishing is widely recognised internationally as being among the gold standard programmes of international aid. I think you're completely mischaracterising what British aid actually does in the world. OK, so Britain is the gold standard. Afghanistan is one of Britain's principal recipients of aid. Uh, a recent audit uh, showed that uh, since 2002, approximately 30% of the American aid that had gone to Afghanistan was lost to waste, fraud and abuse. There's lots of reports like this. Illicit money flowing out of Africa has amounted to, uh, since to, uh, in the last few years, some three times the amount of aid going into Africa and so on. Isn't this all going to show that international aid isn't about need uh, of the recipients, but rather about chess beating, about Western virtue? You are absolutely right about what's happened with US aid to Afghanistan, which has been because it's been about achieving military success. It's been a, a sort of corollary to attempting to fight the war and impose America's will in Afghanistan. Um, again, this is not typical of what UK aid, for the most part, is doing around the world. And if you're talking about illegal flows out of Africa and other countries, you know what's the source of a lot of this corruption, of these illegal financial flows that we see from uh, the developing world and elsewhere. It's the arms trade, which is one of the biggest source of kickbacks and corruption in international trade. But do you not accept that at least some international aid has helped prop up corrupt dictators and kleptocrats? Of course. So I think that aid programmes need very careful monitoring and evaluation. And like, as Michael was saying, uh, on, on military force, it needs to be deployed strategically. And if it's deployed wrongly, uh, then it can have counterproductive effects. But I think sometimes British aid does have counterproductive effects. None of this is a reason not to be giving aid in the first place. Dr Perlo Freeman, thank you very much. Our next witness is Ian Birrell, who's a foreign correspondent, contributing editor of The Mail on Sunday, a long-time critic of international uh, development aid. Um, uh, Mr Birrell, what, did, what do you say to those uh, who think the pandemic has made global poverty worse and aid is needed more than ever? I think the pandemic has definitely made global poverty worse. It's probably set, set back wealth in a lot of countries by about 20 years. Uh, the reason really being due to the lockdowns imposed in countries with very young populations where the, where the fatality rate has been very low from COVID. But that's a separate question. The issue is, what is the best way to help the poor in the world and the dispossessed and people who need help? And my argument is not whether we have a moral duty to do so. I definitely think we do have that duty. Uh, my problem is that I think aid actually makes the matters worse. Matthew Turner? If a WhatsApp message went around my comfortable Clapham neighbourhood suggesting a whip round for one of two purposes, either a donation to the local food bank or to erect gates to stop intruders threatening our property, I think intuitively we'd see the former as more moral than the latter. Why, why does that metaphor not work at the scale of national policy? I'm not arguing that it's a binary choice between defence and aid at all. I'm merely arguing that if we want to alleviate poverty and conflict and corruption in poorer parts of the planet, uh, although it seems on the surface a really good thing to do, which is to spend a lot of money helping those places, in practice, from what I've seen and from what a lot of the uh, world's leading experts in this area say, actually it does more harm than good. 
because if local conditions are hostile to development, then aid is not useful and it perpetuates the conditions which lead to the problems in that country. So is your problem with aid the reality of how it's distributed, how it works? Or do you think there's something inherently problematic about the idea of international aid? I think there's, uh, in most cases, something inherently problematical. I think it's a sort of neo-colonial mindset intended really for the uh, donor to feel good about themselves and look at where the aid goes and it's dictated by uh, local domestic needs, not the needs on the ground, and look at the impact of it and it has a disastrous record. Ask yourself why it is that the poverty gap which is the amount needed to get everyone over the poverty line globally, uh, was calculated a couple of years ago at $66 billion. And yet aid is more than double that each year. Something is going wrong. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think I want to plead guilty as charged that, that I don't feel good about myself when I read about us spending money on Trident, but I do feel good about myself as a British citizen when I hear about us investing in humanitarian relief supporting international institutions like the UN or the WHO, helping fight diseases like malaria, um, or even when it comes to more controversial aid, like money we give to Pakistan, which mainly is spent on trying to get education for children. Why shouldn't I feel good about these things? It's fine for you to feel good about it. I'm not really interested in how good you feel or how good politicians feel. No, but you've suggested that aid is driven. No, but you've suggested that aid is driven by some kind of piety, and I'm saying no. It's driven by the material consequences it has for the world's most disadvantaged people. Why is it pious or wrong to be proud of helping people who need help? Because you're not helping, you're making it worse. My interest is what's actually happening on the ground. And I've seen so often and so many things show that when you put aid into the wrong places, it makes matters worse. You choose Pakistan. Well, my interest in Pakistan was when I was there and I went to a conference and I heard economists from the very libertarian right through to the Marxist left all unite around only one issue. And that was how disastrous it was, these arrogant aid flows coming into their country and making the corruption worse and flowing into the arms of the military. So you'll have a, you know, when the Chancellor cuts aid, that will be a success, a success based on the fact that you've you know, powerfully identified things that have gone wrong, but you haven't really said anything about the humanitarian aid, about the supporting of the international institutions, about fighting malaria. Why don't you want to talk about why the ways in which aid helps? I'm quite happy to talk about it. I'm very happy to put forward what I'd like to see us doing. I think if we really want to help the world's poorest places, there are lots of things we can do. Let's tackle the tax dodging, which stems the flows of dirty money. Let's legalise drugs to weaken crime gangs around the world. Let's loosen borders for trade and people. Let's end the sale of weapons to despotic regimes. There's lots of things we can do. Uh, But what we shouldn't do is naively think that by throwing lots of money around the world and giving it to rich people in poor places and fueling conflict and fueling corruption, we're actually doing good. We might feel better at home, but it's doing a lot of harm on the ground. Ash Sarkar? In the 18th century, there was this English commercial expert called Malachi Postlethwaite, and he was enthusiastic about the fact that British trade is a magnificent superstructure on an African foundation. So he's celebrating that... Britain was made rich by the impoverishment, the enslavement and the degradation of others. So regardless of whether you think that the aid industry is the right means to do so, do you agree that there is a specific historical obligation for Britain to redistribute the wealth it has garnered over the centuries from the underdevelopment of Africa? I certainly think that uh, Britain hasn't faced up to its historical legacy and the damage done by colonialism, which can still be traced today in parts of West Africa. Uh, in the ways societies communicate with each other. So yes, I do think there's an issue there and I do think we have an obligation. Part of my problem is the fact that we're actually perpetuating the same sort of arrogant attitude seen in colonial times. We're saying essentially we're infantilising people abroad and we're saying we have all the answers, we have the right to tell you how to run your education system, how to run your public services, what you should be doing. We're telling you to do that and here's the checkbook that buys us that influence, buys us that power. But let's be real, when and this government is talking about cutting back on foreign aid spending. It's not because they've read Walter Rodney and they've come to the conclusion that the charity sector is the arm of neocolonialism. It's a different kind of signal entirely that they think that these countries in the global south, they don't deserve our money anymore. Instead, they want to invest in defence and pull up the drawbridge. So do you really think we're about to see an orientation away from arms dealing or propping up corrupt regimes and in favour of the things that you've said you believe in, like drug legalisation or better, more liberal immigration policy? No, but then uh, I'm pleased to see that less money is going to be doing damage around the world. 
uh, even if I don't agree with the reasons for doing it. I feel quite uncomfortable often that my arguments are taken up by people that I'm diametrically opposed to, but that doesn't mean I should stop making those arguments. I think when it comes to the conditionality of aid spending and the way in which it's a projection of Britain's soft power, I'm in agreement that that certainly undermines the moral authority of aid projects and certainly the image the establishment would like to project of it being caring and cuddly. But mightn't it also be a useful tool in the advancement of human rights? If you make aid spending conditional, it means that you've got a bit of clout behind demanding the expansion of democratic freedoms or the expansion of education or of reproductive rights and so on. But it doesn't happen. We're pumping money into some of the world's worst regimes from Rwanda to China to Uganda. And look at the claims being made. I once tried to delve down. People talk about the transparency of DFID. Actually, it's very hard to try and really find out what's happening. I tried to burrow down into their statistics. And once they claimed that they were giving money to 13 countries which were advancing democracy, when I delved down, that included Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe, a vote in Pakistan where there was sectarian violence, an election in Yemen where there was just one candidate, another in Uganda, which is a notoriously corrupt and badly governed country. And you're perpetuating the misery and the autonomy autocracy being imposed on the local people. Ian Birrell, thank you very much indeed. Our last witness is the Reverend Professor Sabina al Kaya, who's uh, Director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, Professor al Kaya, what do you say to the argument you've just heard, uh, that often quoted statement that aid is a way for poor people in rich countries to subsidise rich people in poor countries? I think the shared ground with Ian was that there is a commitment to reducing poverty, and this seems to be a time for global Britain to show leadership in tackling poverty and to create a historic inflection point during the COVID pandemic itself. And a broad spectrum of people recognize that we should act in solidarity with those who are vulnerable both within our borders and abroad, and that the costs are relatively small but can pack power. And given that poverty is rising, it's a time to care and not to cringe, to find institutions that aren't working and improve them, to engage and indeed to lead and not to retreat. Melanie Phillips? You say that Britain should show leadership in tackling world poverty. Uh, Do you think that the principal duty of a nation state is to its own citizens or to that of other countries? I think that those are a false dichotomy, that there is a clear duty to one's own citizens, that's the primary role of government, But there is also a concern for for direct intrinsic reasons, not only soft power reasons, to support those who are vulnerable um, and governments that do not have the resources that Britain has and that Britain has benefited from some of those countries. You say it's a false dichotomy, but as you know, we're in a situation where money is incredibly tight. We're in the one of the, the, the worst uh, and unprecedented economic crisis uh, that has ever been. Uh, we can't afford to spend money that we want on everything. Which should we prefer? Which, which should we give a priority to? Defence of the nation or international aid? But that is not the trade-off, and I, I would push back on that. Um, aid is less than 2%, less than 1.75% of what government spends. We heard that from Professor Clark, defence was less than 5%, but okay. aid is much, much smaller. But I wanted to press you further on the principle behind my question. What, in your view, is the moral basis of giving uh, to other countries millions of pounds in British taxpayers' money, uh, which basically takes money away from the services to domestic populations, such as uh, care and policing and other stuff that is necessary for people's welfare, and giving it to other countries? I think that, first of all, that there is a, a large voice of public opinion across a broad spectrum politically, but also including military and others, that aid is much cheaper than fighting wars, for example, as General Lord David Richard said, a former head of the British Army, but that there, there is a recognition widely that these are not choices, that there is something about the identity, about being out and about as, as British people, and about leading in, in the work abroad that involves concern for the most marginalised, the poorest. But you say it's not a matter of choice, but it is as far as state spending is concerned because the state cannot spend on everything. Isn't international aid more properly the province of private charity, whereas defence is the first duty of the state? And so when it comes to a question of which has the greater priority, surely the mor- in, on a moral basis, defence must come first. As others have said, both defence and aid certainly have their legitimacy and both are operations of the state. 
but there is a understanding of the kind of expertise and the kind of infrastructure that aid can support that perhaps personal private individuals are not able to. And you think of the gender expertise in the staff abroad, you think of their ability to um, engage in difficult political contexts across language, across barriers. These are things that private charity perhaps could not do so efficiently. And that is also in a time when Britain is leading the G7, when it's trying to come to the climate change conference and create a global presence, support for the UN agencies, which is one third of British aid, is clearly a role in that. But so is engagement directly with different governments. Anne McElvoy? Do you think that Britain will be morally impoverished by pulling back from this concrete numerical target of 0.7% expenditure on international aid? I believe it will, that there is something about keeping one's commitments that builds trust. And trust has also um, benefits of other kinds in terms of contracts, in terms of demand from other, other nations. Um, Can can I just then come straight off the back of that? Because my question is this. Why should the UK be diminished morally if very few countries hit the same target? I think that that, that it's not all about us. It's really about the poor. And we work on multidimensional poverty. By that measure, 1.3 billion people are in poverty. And from COVID, that will rise. But there is an opportunity during the COVID pandemic for Britain to lead. So I'll give an example. We looked across 75 countries at how poverty had reduced, and it had reduced in 65 of them. And the fastest reduction of 5 billion people in 65 countries was in Sierra Leone. And it was in during the years 2013 to 2017 when Britain was leading the response to the Ebola crisis. Britain has a kind of understanding of how during a crisis and a pandemic, with all of its stresses, with all of its terror, um, not only to respond to the Ebola pandemic, but to reduce poverty Beyond that, we're making a link here, or I think you you have done between sort of poverty alleviation and and stability. And I would put to you that it may be being oversold. This is not to say that poverty alleviation or indeed high aid spending is not something to do, but it's not maybe absolutely what you want, and that the real risk, however nasty wars may be in in Africa between impoverished states or civil wars, the big tension, the big dangers, as Henry Kissinger said this week, come from China, Russia and their relations and standoffs with the US. You might have to kind of admit it doesn't buy you as much as you think it does. I think in terms of human suffering and in terms of poverty numbers, it buys you a lot. But if you think of China itself, in 2014, China set to end poverty by 2020. And they went about it with a great deal of energy and a great deal of political commitment, commitment of resources. And that is something of global leadership. And it would be appropriate, it would seem, to also explore other ways of addressing poverty and and also of learning uh, across different boundaries of different governments of how they have done that and how they have led. Professor Alkaya, thanks very much indeed. Well, well, panel, it's been interesting the way these two issues have have kind of intermeshed throughout this argument. Uh, Somewhere near the beginning, Matthew, you you raised uh, the suggestion that defence was inherently morally ambiguous. I think you did it with the first witness, Professor Clark, who said it wasn't morally ambiguous. What, what did you mean and how do you think that played out in the argument? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that Michael Clark makes a good argument for the legitimate role of defence. But I think as often happens, when people want to go beyond a perfectly reasonable argument that defence is morally neutral, but it is necessary, and they want to argue beyond that, that it is moral, I think they quickly, as he did, end up in a slightly difficult position because they have to then explain the ways in which we actually spend this money. And a lot of it doesn't really seem to be about the things that you would do if your absolute priority was defending the people of Britain. A lot of it seems to do with power broking, status uh, signalling. So uh, I, I, I thought he was, you know, I thought what he said was extremely interesting, but it rather confirmed my view that the, the kind of moral case for defence is, is hard to make. Melanie Phillips? I think he made a very reasonable point. Uh, you know, uh, just because you support the principle of defence doesn't mean that you approve of every military adventure that's ever been. That's He's making a distinction between the practice and the principle. But his point about power broking, I mean, I disagree with Matthew very much because I think that the point uh, that I would make about power broking is that it's actually necessary for the country's defence. I mean, how is a country to be regarded if a country is 
uh, militarily strong or if a country is uh, principally known for its charitable endeavours abroad. Which do you think is the country that people who have bad intentions would see as the more likely victim? You have to project power in order to prevent war. If you project weakness, then you invite war. And that's the point about power broking. It's not simply a matter of, you know, puffing your chest in a jingoistic fashion. I would say your first duty is to make sure that your own people are safe from attack. Um, And to me, that is the moral imperative. Ash, what do you think about that? So for me, there is this tension between militarization and the safety of your citizens at home. And that was one of the things that I wanted to get Professor Clark's thoughts on. I don't necessarily think that uh, were we to project less hard power around the world, that we would automatically be less safe. I mean, I think that Sweden and Norway, Scandinavian countries are having an all right time of it. Um, And while I didn't necessarily buy what Professor Clark was selling, I thought that he raised some particularly interesting and challenging questions for progressives and and for the left, because the position tends to be that, you know, since 1945, there's not been a good war and there never will be again. I don't think the left has got its head around what it thinks about military intervention in the totality. And that's because of the kind of, you know, psychological scarring of Afghanistan and uh, of Iraq. I think there was one thing which which I think Professor Clark really underestimated. And that was the importance of the profit motive, because militaries do sell their services around the world to domestic police forces, for instance, and they boast that their training is battle tested. So I don't think that you can do what he argues you can do, which is separate the military from other spheres of public life. And I do think that there is this need for conflict to continue in order to keep the arms and the defence industries going. And McElvoy, this this first part, uh, particularly when we got to the stage of comparing, if you like, the defence budget and and the Mm. aid budget and so on, the other side of the argument, our second witness, Dr Pello Freeman, put some of it, was that the one, i.e. defence spending, was national self-interest, whereas international aid was a matter of global responsibility and he saw a distinct moral gradient between the two. Yes, I I was pressing on that because I think it's very questionable indeed. For instance, if you believe in a strong liberal democratic order, and I don't really care the politics within that, to the left, to the right, or in the the mushy centre, you will want to advocate for it. You will want to project it, as we'd say, of military force a bit around the world because you think it's a good thing because you're defending a system. You're defending a system of liberal, pluralist values in a world which is getting in many quarters more autocratic and more dangerous. And a good example, I've read, you know, slightly counter to what Ash has just said, if you look at Denmark, if you look at Sweden, they do project force and they do believe that they are defending the rights of of women, the freedoms to worship. The fact is they're smaller than us, so it's perhaps uh, it causes less, less fuss. But that's the only difference. It's a difference of scale. You should defend your liberal order as well as yourselves. Matthew, uh, our third witness, Ian Birrell, made a a very powerful case. It was an interesting case, wasn't it? Because his case against international aid was not uh, on, if you like, the more refined moral basis of our responsibility to uh, people a long way away. His case was based on the fact that it makes matters worse rather than making matters better. But that is a moral position, isn't it? Yeah, isn't I'm glad Ian Barrell is there giving the development establishment a hard time, but I, I couldn't understand why he wasn't willing to recognise that whilst there really are problems, that a great deal of money is being spent effectively. And I think that led him to... I mean, for example, he talked about us putting money into things that we say matter, but overwhelmingly the things that we put money into are things which the world says matter, education of children or the eradication of sickness or the response to humanitarian crises. So these aren't things that, you know, we have simply decided ourselves in a colonial way that we want to impose on the world. This is about us playing our part in a a set of values and goals which the world signs up to. And the second worry I had with him is, is his obsession with us giving money to dodgy regimes 
Well, what is our responsibility then? Do we simply leave the victims of dictatorships to their fate? Or do we, as very brave development workers do, go into an extremely difficult problematic situation and try to find ways of helping people, even though those people are victims of terrible regimes? If you're going to use taxpayers' money uh, to spend on other people in the world, you've got to be absolutely certain that it's going to a cause, to go to further a cause that you want it to go to. If you're spending taxpayers' money a significant proportion of which goes to make the situation even worse, goes to prop up dictators and kleptocrats, goes to institutionalise corruption, does not actually help alleviate poverty, which is alleviated instead by doing other stuff like helping them to become capitalists, helping them to start businesses and all the rest of it. The idea that you have a moral obligation to spend taxpayers' money on that is the opposite of morality. It is a a moral obscenity, actually. Ash, Ian Birrell, I think, uh, felt uh, a lot of the aid industry was a, not only was it infantilising people abroad, but it was a form of neo-colonialism. Did that resonate with you? I mean, it did. And if you told me last week that I'd find myself in agreement with David Cameron's ex- ex-speechwriter, I'd have wrestled you to the ground and had you sedated. Um, so I was really surprised by the amount of agreement I found myself in with him. Because I do share in his analysis that charity has often been the lubricant of underdevelopment and of exploitation rather than the solution to it. Where I differ from him is this idea that any reduction in aid spending is good because of how bad aid spending has made things in certain countries. Uh, McElvoy, our last witness, Professor al called on us to care and not to cringe. She had some good lines, I thought, one one way or the other. Uh, But she felt that we would be... uh, ourselves morally impoverished if we if we cut back on I- international aid. Uh, I, I wasn't clear that she actually really dealt with uh, the fact that other countries which are internationally well regarded like Germany and New Zealand don't spend anything like as much as a proportion of national income as we do and they don't seem to be morally impoverished by that. I did think that uh, the professor didn't really feel that she could answer that question, or at least she couldn't in the in Well, the she said, so we, she, she, well, she said, on, she she said went, we she, should she lead, said, was what she said. Mm. Yes, all right. And then her example at the end on leadership seemed to be China. And I, I have to say, if there's one example of absolutely cynical deployment, of aid, which is pushed into countries, pulled back from purely um, for calculating purposes by Beijing, it would be China. And obviously, internally, you know, it's its situation in terms of where, absolutely where aid should be targeted on the Uyghurs and things. You can't even get anywhere near them because the state is so repressive. So I felt it was a bit otherworldly, to be honest. However, I do believe that in the end, you have to make the case that if you want to spend 0.765, whatever you want, that you believe in it in itself. It's something I think Matthew Taylor was angling for throughout the the program as well. I think if you try to overcomplicate it by saying it will make you a world leader, it'll cure all your ills, get yourself into a terrible tangle. I think she her case was strongest when she said it's simply the right thing to do. Matthew, uh, we're near the end of the program here. Draw a moral balance after what you've heard uh, between defence spending and aid spending. Yeah, I think for me, I end up confirmed in my view that aid aid is moral but sometimes goes wrong, whereas defence is morally ambiguous but sometimes involves doing good. OK, that's it for this week. From our panel, Ash Sarkar, Anne McElvoy, Melanie Phillips and Matthew Taylor. And from me, until the same time next week, take care. Goodbye.